Hello, everyone, and Eid Mubarak to everyone who is celebrating. Um, thank you for tuning into our discussion today. I hope, if anything, we can achieve um, some really lovely lunches and dinners with all this chat about food that's about to come up. Um, I'm very excited to be joined by Dakani Ayubi, who uh, is, is the founder of the family-run Pawana restaurant in South Adelaide, Australia, and writer of an upcoming recipe book, uh, Pawana Recipes and Stories from an Afghan Kitchen. I'm also joined by Marcel Saik, who's the director of Key Point London, an Afghan-British barbecue restaurant, which brings inclusive Afghan dishes to its London customers. And also by Cobra Nawazada, who's founder of the Afghan Tea Company, which is a platform created to bring people together to embrace cultural commonalities while delivering delicious Afghan tea and desserts. So we'll kick today's discussion off with Masal. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your journey into opening your, your restaurant, uh, Key Point? Yeah, of course. Like, um, I guess the journey, <laughs> like, it's really, really started for me when I left university and started a job in advertising and uh, I wasn't getting paid very much. So I was like, oh, I need another job um, because I was just like an intern. And then this food festival started uh, um, in Hackney. In, which is used to be one of the like quite socioeconomically lower um, demographics and boroughs in London. A lot of crime, one of the worst places to live. Uh, and so it was amazing that this food festival right at my door. So I was like, right, I'll work there in the evenings. I'll do my job in the mornings. Um, and working there in the evenings, it was amazing because it was like diverse street food. Uh, like this is incredible. But every time I'd invite my family, Afghan um, and Muslim, and um, some of my friends, they would keep rejecting and I'd wonder why. And then you start to look at the background of these things and you realize that as much as this is an you know diverse food festival in Hackney, the entry price is a certain amount, making it exclusive already. So a family my size, which is a big Afghan family, would pay at least 40 pounds just to enter. And then once they enter, there's a one place, two, maybe two places that are halal. And again, they are Indian, or you know, again, they're stereotypically like the same places that we always go to. They wanted to try the barbecue, but they can't. You know, they want to try this and they can't. Um, and while working there, I met my partner and fiance and business partner, head chef, who was the smoke barbecue guy of there. Um, and we kind of got together and the more we worked in hospitality, just got really frustrated with the fact that my families couldn't come and eat with his family. He's British Guyanese. And it just got more and more like calling up. How many times do you need to call? How many restaurants to find a space where everyone... And it just kind of opens your eyes as to why we do have such a rise in Islamophobia, why we do have such a rise in microaggressionally racist things, because people, Muslims and non-Muslims, and you know, even like um, uh, black people from African and Caribbean descent, they don't eat pork for a lot of different um, cultural reasons. And that's why, again, you don't have people sitting in the same spaces. Yeah, And I find that really bizarre. We shouldn't just have a place just for Muslims and a place just for this. So we've always chased um, bar restaurants, places with alcohol, so that there will be customers from London and clients, Western clients, and then halal barbecue. <laughs> like, and so we have women in burqa and niqab coming in and eating, and then our other clients going, I didn't know Muslims could come inside a place served alcohol. I was like, well, it's actually a preference and it's a choice and it's nice to have this conversation now about it. Um, and yeah, so I think it's very much a journey of just growing and realizing that there wasn't a space that was producing foodie, sophisticated foods that was both for the clientele of like Britain of the, you know, the foodies here, but also people that were also foodies, but also kind of had respect for their cultural and religious backgrounds. Like they still like smoked barbecue, but they like halal smoked barbecue. Mm -hmm. They don't like cocktails, but they love a mocktail. You know, why wouldn't you? Why should you not also have that? Why should you be stuck to one thing? And um, the more we've grown, like our following and our customers are very active. They're so nice. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a really lovely journey that way. And growing. <laughs> Yeah. So kind of coming off that, um, in terms of the fact that you're basically seeking here to platform Afghan cuisine and, and, and culture with unfamiliar aud audiences, why do you think that's so important in a more like fine tuned point of just like why have you, from your experiences of bringing these flavours to new palettes and bringing these sort of um, different cultural considerations and bringing people together in one space, like wh what's been the reception to that? Why, why is it shown to be so important? I think the reception has been a little bit eye-opening and it's almost as if, um, so you know, Black Lives Matter 
happened as the biggest and most important, in my opinion, civil rights movement of our time. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is so crucial because of the fact that systemically, there are a lot of parts of all of our departments, not just the hospitality industry, but financial, this, that, are exclusive. And that means that certain people don't get places due to that. And instead of trying to battle everything forefront, it's just, I think it's just quite important, like looking through and realizing going into your own industry with a little thin needle and going, well, what is it in my space mm -hmm. that isn't working that's systemically wrong? Oh, it's not everyone's a racist. I believe that most of us are, but it's more so that the systems are not made for people uh, from LGBTQI, from disabled communities, from, you know, black and ethnic minority, they're not actually made for everybody in that sense, because we haven't sat down and had the thought, oh, the demographic of London is a melting plot of diverse culture, and yet the food and spaces seems to look that, but we haven't actually created a space that they can sit down and enjoy that. Mm -hmm. The chefs are of Muslim background, of a Caribbean background, but they can't sometimes taste their own food because there's pork. And I find that fascinating. I'm like, the artist has created you this, but he can't even try his art. Like, what? <laughs> and just uh, being able to have this chat. And people have received it in that kind of way. They've been like, oh, I didn't. Yeah, actually, that's really true. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, well, that's why we keep having the same amazing, diverse restaurants, but with the same people in them. And I think everyone should have the chance to be able to sit and enjoy sophisticated foodie trends and things as much as the next person. And if we keep doing this, uh, I've had I've had amazing response to the narcos. Like people have really, you know, it's been like, what's a narco? I'm like, it's an Afghan taco. <laughs> you take a taco, it's appropriated already, and you reappropriate it, and you show that. At the moment, in the mo main opinion I see of people have of Afghans is the same things the media shows. So terrorists, this, this, the same things I was bullied at at school for is Bin Laden, your uncle. I said yes every time. I was like, I'm going to say yes to all of you, but things like this. And now I know it sounds silly, but something now that in the London press, at least like we were in the Guardian and stuff with the narco. Uh -huh. And I was like, OK, now you can see that now the narco is another thing. And maybe you can digest that Afghans may be more than what you just have here with something that you literally can digest, <laughs> like yeah. something that you enjoy, that you like, that is in your spaces. We make sure we have a lot of Western bloggers, influencers. We make sure we make a balance at all times between British Afghan so that it is always inclusive. It's not just Afghan. It's not just this. It's no, guys, this is British Afghan because mm -hmm. I'm British Afghan. This is where's a lot of British Afghans <laughs> and, and, and you guys like me. So look, <laughs> like, it's been really fascinating. I've had such an amazing experience with customers with their feedback on it. It's been great. Imagine. Um, I, I think probably now I'll move on to Cobra on a similar note. Um, the idea that what we're talking about here, the kind of values that really drive and make a, a something work as such when it's driven by such like a big message behind just what is a food or whatever. Um, could you tell us about your journey into founding your online platform and, and uh, the Afghan tea company and the kind of same idea of what values your online community is kind of built upon? Yes, yeah, so um, the Afghan Tea Company was founded in um, 2018, and it, initially it was a, 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 just a creative space where I could showcase Afghan culture in a mainstream food market, which is exactly what, as Marcel was saying, it, it looks like it's out there, but when I wanted an Afghan dessert, I couldn't find it in the mainstream market. I had to go to specific secular areas of London to find it. Um, mm -hmm. And then on the, at the same time, I, I personally felt underrepresented because I want, I'm a British born Afghan and um, I've grown up here, but I have very strong ties with like with culture and uh, food connections. <laughs> I love Afghan food and everything that comes with that. But when I go into um, the shops or the huge supermarkets, I could find, for example, Arab sweets like baklava, but I can't find um, Afghan desserts or I can find samosas, but I can't find sort of Afghan foods in the freezer and the normal, you know, mainstream market. 
supermarket. So that was one one aspect of it. And I wanted to create a space where I could showcase in a creative way Afghan food that also represented people like me who are the diaspora living in the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the time, in 2018, I had been working with asylum seekers for about two years. And I really got to see um, the, what they struggled with and their vulnerabilities and the whole host of problems that come with being a refugee in the United Kingdom. Um, and so one of the one aspect of the struggle was an identity crisis almost and this loss of the sense of home and mm. finding refinding that sense and trying to recreate that that sense of home in a new place where you're both being told by the media and society that you need to integrate yourself into this society but at the same time there's nothing that you can identify with and so there was that finding that balance so the idea behind the afghan tea company really the intention was to create a space where people could say well it's okay to have diversity in your identity you can be british and you can also love your afghan culture and you can also be you know all sorts of ways if you wanted to and we shouldn't put a cap on what you're allowed to identify yourself as Mm -hmm. um so that was the idea behind it and so since 2018 we've really grown a lot and i've i've really prided myself in having one-to-one really intimate vulnerable conversations with people about their experiences and to try, try to figure out ways of like how can we what can we what can we do to um sort of promote or how do we give you a platform so you have your voice and you have your say and you showcase yourself. Um, and so that is where we've grown. So in, initially I spent a lot of time focusing on like, let's try to find common ground. And I found common ground in a cup of tea because I feel like that's something global, it's universal. Everyone loves a cuppa. They <laughs> so many different ways to have a cup of tea. And ev- yeah, everyone really likes and enjoys um, desserts. So I thought that was a good way. I personally love the Afghan desserts. I love the Afghan pink tea. So that was my way of doing it. But as I said, I was talking to a lot of asylum seekers. I was was learning a lot myself. And there were a few things which I've now put as at the forefront um, of our values in the Afghan tea company. The first thing is that I learned, and I, I really want to promote this, is that integration shouldn't mean everyone looks the same integration should be you know a a space where everyone can be very diverse and we have to be very careful when we're talking about um finding common ground not to flatten people's identity so i'm give you everyone should have the choice to to be you know free to choose how they want to identify themselves as um and we shouldn't suppress parts of ourselves just because it doesn't fit into a social norm Uh that was really that's really a key part of what we do um uh the other part was that what i understood from uh, refugees and and speaking with refugees a lot um is that we need to change this narrative that afghanistan and south asian countries are less educated so there's this aspect of when I come here, I need to you need to teach me everything. And the Western countries are, you know, we need to teach you everything. We need to teach you how to be civilized. We need to teach you how to uh, uh-huh. integrate into society. We need to uh, help you learn uh, what it means to be a good citizen and stuff, which is great in, in many ways. Uh, but at the same time, there's so much um, wisdom and so much um intelligence and wisdom that comes from our ancestors that we shouldn't forget because at the moment for example when i look at um uh when medical research and the way science is going at the moment a lot of funding and a lot of um, research is going into the natural spices that we our ancestors were using for many years for medicinal purposes so things like herbs and spices and homemade remedies where we were already using it, our mm-hmm. ancestors were already using it before the research went into it. And so what we, what the Afghan tea company is now doing is educating in this respect so that we don't lose that aspect of, of us and we have something to be proud of to say, well, yes, we do things differently, but we were already doing this. The things that you, 
the Western world is now researching and finding out is things that the Eastern world was already doing for decades and decades and decades, right? So um, our values really is the integration um, about educating on our our values and our um, wisdom that we have with us so that we can take, you know, we'll learn something from you, but you could also learn something from us, right? It's, exactly. not, it's not a one-way system. Um, and so the last thing is that we need to have more open conversations about mental health because um, Afghanistan is a country that has been through so much trauma continuously, right? And people are making these traumatic um, journeys to escape a traumatic experience and they're coming into the UK and although we, relatively UK is, you know, seems to be welcoming, it's this idea that then they come here and then they've lost their sense of home and they've lost their sense of identity and then mm -hmm. trying to integrate without knowing themselves and we mustn't forget that a lot of people who are coming are youngsters and at that age we are um, already at that age where we're trying to figure out who we are and then we come here and then we're kind of like lost of like who am I how am I supposed to be should I be you know should I integrate too much into society or you know if I do I might does that make me less Afghan and they've got strong ties still back home in Afghanistan mm -hmm. so it's really about trying to find the balance so that you don't feel pressured into you know losing your way or losing your sense of identity and so more conversations need to be had about mental health that the stigma needs to be removed from it so I'm really trying to use this platform to be um, a space to remove the stigma and just have these open conversations about mental health like we all have mental health the same way we all have blood pressure, the same way we all have uh, a blood sugar level, and then we fluctuate uh, to, you know, in time in life, we may have peaks, we may have troughs, we have ups and downs all the time. And some people are more prone to having those illnesses the same way where some of us are prone to um, sort of uh, illnesses such as cancer or diabetes, things like that. Some of us are more prone. And so we need to have these more these uh, conversations openly, and I think people should have a space where they share this. So that's really the three main values of mm -hmm. the Afghan Tea Company at the moment. We need to be um, it's just a, providing a space where we can be creative with the food and have it something that we are all interested in. But at the same time, have the open space to have these conversations. Yeah. It's definitely the, the idea of creating a space where people can find their own kind of sense of home. And um, when you've yeah. felt that kind of loss of leaving somewhere or uh, trying to find a new kind of space for yourself. And it's, as you say, there's so many aspects that, that feed into that in terms of like mental health support. And but then even stuff as simple as, as, as what you do and, and the flavors and preparing something with someone and um, how that can kind of bring people together and, and, and find that sense of home that you're talking about um uh Darkani, in terms of this i mean this this idea of a physicality of home um you were forced to flee afghanistan when you were a child um tell us a little bit about you know how you feel about the importance of feeling close and connected um to the home that you left behind and, and how you kind of find that connection sure thanks kate um and eid mubarak to any of your listeners who might be celebrating um I guess I was just listening to Morsal and Cobra and just like nodding vigorously because um, so much of what they're speaking about is about um, identity and a loss of identity and how you feel that void when you're kind of, when you're not on that connection, you don't have that connection to ancestral lands that so many of our ancestors before us have had. What happens when that chain is broken? And so for me and my siblings, we were all under the age of nine when my family left Afghanistan in um, 1985. So that was at the height of the um, Cold War during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. And I guess, you know, for my parents, the experience of exile was really different than the experience of it for us as children because my parents have this tangible link of having lived most of their lives in Afghanistan. They have like really live connections to the land and to the people that grew up there and the spaces there and the monuments and the, the traditions and cultures. And then we were all just these young kids who all of a sudden the beginning of our life is marked by trauma, whether that's, you know, conscientized or a lot later in life or, or not at all, you know? And so 
you're kind of left with this void. And so being able to find those connections through language. So, you know, we still spoke Dari. Dari was our first language before we went to school and learned English, um, as well as, you know, another really big focal point. And I think for a lot of diaspora communities living around the world is food. Um, you know, like it's such a wonderful way to stay connected to your history and to your memories. And I think even for parents, um, Cobra was talking about the trauma of, um, you know, leaving, fleeing a country, a war-torn country. You know, it's almost like a healing, a meditation to stay connected to that food and to the rituals um, and traditions associated with that food. So for myself um, growing up, I think what I learned to do was try to negotiate and find myself in that void rather than being lost in it. And uh, I think that it's closely linked to, again, what Cobra was mentioning about mental health. You know, you have to find yourself. You have to find a way to um, walk in the two worlds of cultures that are really quite disparate, you know, and you find yourself kind of not belonging fully to either world because you don't have that same tangible experience as your mum and dad might have had. And then you never completely belong to your the community in your new home because there are so many things that you know because of your religious and cultural backgrounds are never mm -hmm. as acceptable or as unquestioned so for me really that growing up was about trying to find my way through those paradoxes and to find myself and to come into my own and to kind of reject parts of culture that are overly dogmatic from both worlds, from the Western world, from the Eastern tradition, you know, and to try and forge something that was that's really familiar because of your ancestry is so important, right? And you have to hold on to those small hints and clues of connections that you have that at the same time was an evolution because the trajectory of our life had evolved. Um, and so, yeah, as we were growing up, the connections that were really important were things like language and food. And, you know, you kind of go through your teenage years a bit oblivious and doing things a bit begrudgingly. And then you grow older and you realize how important it is to understand those connections because, you know, even though it's been decades or well, 35 years since my family's been in Australia, that ancestry and those kind of that interlinked chain of history and that Afghanistan as like a homeland it's it still defines me and it's shaped the trajectory of my life and I kind of came to understand the importance of that more and more and I think that's kind of really what spurred me to stay really connected to my heartlines to be really involved in my family's like restaurant and to explore Afghan cuisine and its importance it's, it's an anchor an anchor to the past so that you can live well and live with fullness in your present mm -hmm. and um, and eventually I've just been really lucky to have this experience of being able to explore all of that and the history of all of it and my, my own history my own ancestry mm -hmm. um and compile that into like a narrative and a recipe book so yeah it's really important <laughs> those and and how was it for your family in terms of you talk about these kind of larger cultural memories but in terms of kind of solidifying your family memories and your family identity how you know the, the restaurant opening must have just been so important for that how is that over the years how have you seen that to kind of encourage your family and 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 see a sort of family memory being created as a result yeah it's it's absolutely been important and i think it's been a, an expression of that family journey of exile and how different people, depending on generation and age, how you respond to the mm -hmm. changes that kind of come up in your life. And, and at the same time as it's been, uh, it's kind of been an expression of that whole experience, but it's also allowing us to explore that more, you know, because life has changed, you know, and you have to contribute to the community that you find yourself in. So for my family, um, the restaurant has been this really amazing way of kind of being able to bridge that intergenerational gap that exists in all families, but for exiled and diaspora communities is compounded by a cultural gap as well. Mm -hmm. um, kind of negotiate that and to turn it into something that's really positive and inviting and really a healing in so many ways. Um, and so for my mum, who um, 
really like the the food we serve at Parwana is all my mum's kind of recipes. They're things that have been passed down to her, and it was really her intuition that went as a migrant in Australia, coming from a country that's now been traumatized by decades of ongoing conflict in various guises. We have to hold on to our culture. We have to preserve it. We have to share it with people in our new home. And um, we have to find ways to honour it and to keep it alive uh, because really in those conflict zone countries, the first thing to disappear is culture <laughs> and that connection to culture. Your language is erased. Your traditions are erased. Those things are trivialised by whatever occupying forces come by. So for us, we've just had this amazing opportunity to be able to hold on to that. And yeah, it's definitely played a huge part in our self-expression um, as a family and helped us negotiate um, all of the challenges that come with being um, a starting life again in a different culture. Yeah. And then I guess just on a, a basic level for some of our viewers who maybe aren't as familiar with with sort of Afghan cuisine and flavors and ingredients, you know, what what kind of what's your favorite aspects of the of the cuisine, the, the kind of flavors you're dealing with that, that kind of set it apart and, and really bring that kind of feeling of home that we've been talking about? What what kind of things can people see that that, that is what that is for you in terms of the flavors and the yeah, the spices? Mm -hmm. I think one of the most amazing things about Afghan food is that it offers a direct rebuttal for all to all the stereotypes that are attached to it today. So, um, you know, the kind of Morsel was mentioned as well, the, the things attached to Afghanistan today is a narrative of violence and negativity and irreconcilability. Um, it's, it stands as a paradox to modernity and civilization, right? Like the way we see Afghanistan in the dominant narratives today. But for me, and what was really important for me to put into the book was, okay, people want to understand Afghan food. We have to go back thousands of years, you know, and we have to go, actually, civilization is about an exchange, exchange of ideas, philosophies, traditions, ingredients, right? Mm -hmm. And Afghanistan at the center of the ancient Silk Roads stands as a beacon and a testament to that ebb and flow of culture and ideas that underpin civilization today. Mm -hmm. and so for me, Afghan food is amazing in that it's really unique and familiar at the same time because it blends like these Mediterranean flavors of things like yogurts and fresh herbs and rich tomato, garlic, onion-based sauces with these Eastern kind of spices of the, the warm spices, the turmeric, the cinnamon, the coriander, that kind of thing. And it blends them all together in this into this really palatable flavor and palatable mix. And the centerpiece of every Afghan dastarkhan or every Afghan spread is, of course, the rice. And rice for Afghans is a really big deal. Yeah. <laughs> and it actually has a beautiful kind of connection because rice was grown on Afghan lands for generations in families and Afghans respect and love their rice, <laughs> you know, and there are all these things about how you keep rice um, in <laughs> keep them in these traditional um, vats called kandus where there'd be no like aeration and no moisture and that kind of thing and they'd let the rice age for years and years and this was the rice that you served to honorable guests you know so it forms rice forms the centerpiece the other ingredients that and our rice is always jeweled with lots of different things like raisins and nuts and that kind of thing so Afghan food is really a blend of the history of the intercultural mingling that defines human civilization. Um, and that's mixed with indigenous native ingredients. Af Afghanistan is a land that has lots of different climates. So lots of things grow really beautifully, lots of fruits, nuts, that kind of thing. And you find all of that um, in a really palatable, aromatic mix in Afghan food. Yeah. Oh, it's just making me hungry. Oh, tell me <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on that kind of note, Marcel, you know, this kind of conversation we have about the familiar flavors and things like that, your restaurant clearly tries to combine this kind of feeling while also with things like your narcos is a bit of a kind of innovation and creativity. Why do you think this kind of, you know, experimentation is, is so important in terms of combining the familiar, combining the nostalgia, having a space for, you know, all the classic flavors, but then bringing it in, in new ways? Why is this, you know, so important? I think it's so important because 
for me, like especially when researching about Q Point like years ago before we started, and just with food, your demographic is always so important. The country that you are in is so important. That's why the BBC exists. It represents the people, or it's supposed to <laughs> represent the people that is all around. And I think with food, like originally I was going to open Q Point in Italy, so I did all this research about, and there was going to be a lot of Italian flavors mixed in, and you know that it's very much going. If I want, I I don't I want to make Afghan food, but I don't just want to make it for Afghans and Asians. I want to make British Afghan food so that I can get British people to come and enjoy and really experience what we experience. Like we love chutney, you know, everyone has a recipe that their mum makes and uh, we have all these classic dishes. And then my chef and my partner and my mum, they fight over this chutney recipe. Even yesterday and Eve, he, he was like, look, this is my 10th attempt. This is the one we are selling at Q Point. They love it. She's like, no, it's not right. I don't know what you do. And he was like, you're lying to me about what you use. And she's like, I'm not lying. And so it just literally and it's very much about his very British flavors mixing so that we can create something that's palatable for everyone um, it's our hashtag barbecue for the many not the few and I like that because not everyone's gonna like everything but the narcos represents they are what we say that's from Kabul this is the Afghan dish guys uh -huh. and yet every element in them like the jalapeno jam is quite a british thing that my partner's made he's made it halal so that it's accessible but there are things in there that are so british that anyone as well just loves those flavors combined mm -hmm. and it's more about i think i'm going to be honest like afghan cooking is something that my mother's always taught me and and it's experiment with me but uh, it's not something that I've experimented with too much, like I experiment and play here. Um, and so it was, for me, it's a bit different in trying to kind of integrate these two cultures together. Like our, our thing is British Afghan food. So imagine a mac and cheese with a little bit of chives and, you know, like it's very much um, to try and get people to see that we have these flavors that we in the di diaspora, we do also enjoy these things. Uh, there are so many different um, aspects. Uh, yeah, I guess. That. Yeah, yeah, and creating, yeah, as we said before, new spaces and and just new ideas, bringing new ideas to the table constantly. On that note, could you explain your um, kind of uh, meal kits you've been delivering recently and kind of what they entail and how the assembly and everything works of them and 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 yeah, what they entail. <laughs> So what they are, so our meal kits, um, if you look at the menu, so we have uh, obviously the smoked meats and you can either have like a narco kit for three, a narco kit for six, uh, um, and it comes with an array of condiments. It comes with the narcos, the naan, the small little naan, and then the smoked lamb and the smoked brisket and like build instructions, reheating instructions. Our advice on how to build, but you can go rogue. And many of our customers do and share it. And they're like, I'm putting this on here. I'm doing this. We have our brisket bun, which is our like really famous brisket bun kit, but again, three and six. And then we just started to work a little bit with some Afghan recipes. So like a burani kadu. My mom's in, you guys, you know, got a very, very, it's a traditional dish. And what we've done is not bastardize it a little bit, but just a little, <laughs> you know, like we've adjusted it and we backpack it, we backpack everything uh, and we've added a few dishes and we send out the whole meal kit to you to literally reheat in either hot water or in a toaster. We've limited the amount of re like control that our customers have because the chef needs it. <laughs> we don't, well, because before we found that people putting things in ovens, drying out meats, doing bizarre things. So now everything is backpacked and you, you literally boil in a bag. <laughs> mm -hmm. And these are very, and now we've just found that in London, the whole restaurant kit, like, um, experience, even at restaurant kits, which is an amazing platform, they, this has just become the norm. Chefs and Michelin starred chefs, they're placing their things in backpack bags. Um, and we kind of just wanted to do that for a long while. So our entire menu is as served as a meal kit or an mm -hmm. item to be reheated at home. <laughs> um, you know, and it, it's been really fun, actually. It's such a very, a very different experience yeah. go, finding sober freeze and refrigerated boxes and chill tech and things but it's it's nice because everyone's enjoying the diy element to it and sharing yeah. that experience which has been yeah. lovely uh, but, uh sounds like so much fun honestly <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So Cobra, could you tell us a little bit about some of the classic flavors we'd find in Afghan sort of tea and, and the different aspects of that, especially in terms of when we talk about um, sort of cultural elements that are involved with it, the idea of hospitality and generosity within um, Afghan culture and how intrinsic that is, you know, how does that play out in tea culture and, and, and sort of preparing and serving tea to guests and, you know? Um, yeah, hospitality is such a big thing in, in Afghan culture. I mean, considering everything that, you know, um, we've talked about already, that everything that they've been through, through the war, through the trauma, through everything, hospitality and generosity has been a really key um, identifying part of Afghan culture. And um, so, obviously, as I've said, like, speaking with all kinds of different Afghans, it doesn't matter if your um if you what kind of afghan you are which area of afghanistan you're from um this idea that uh having guests in your home is a blessing from god you know they're, they're really seen as like uh yeah a, a really big blessing uh in to come as your home so as soon as they come in they actually they will be so warm and welcoming to make you feel at home um and also they actually sort of are magnets for guests almost they like they love to have guests in their home or we love to have guests in our home and so um uh, you know as soon as someone comes in serving them tea having tea ready i mean in my home growing up we've always had like a large flask of tea that was always brewed in our house and mm -hmm. also like if they're you know sipping it on, on it during the day and whoever came in there was always something to serve there was always food to serve um and that's so that's really part and parcel and it really is testament to um, the kindness and the generosity that Af is really instilled in Afghans, no matter which part of the world you're in right now. Um, that's really a, a really important part of the culture. And I think the flavors are so important as well. It says, as um, uh, that we were talking about, um, it says something about the history of where the food came from and how, it, how we've come to use it. And it's quite interesting because a lot of the people that I've spoken to they have the same similar story about uh, we've got Gorsha Feel, which is one of our best sellers, and it's really a thin, crisp, handcrafted pastry topped with sprinkled with sugar and crushed cardamom and pistachio. And it is very light, very simple, it looks very simple, but it is delicious and it is so loved amongst not only Afghans, like Asians the surrounding Asian countries and that's because the flavors the, uh, the cardamom the pistachios they're all from within that sort of region of South Asia mm -hmm. and um, so that's something that everyone kind of loves and, and cardamom is something we always have in our tea and it's in our desserts quite often used and those flavors really like represent um, sort of the history of Afghanistan of like who we are and how we are and how we like to have our desserts so, there's this one story that is actually quite nice whenever I see an elder, um, an older Afghan who's, who's not had, you know, been back home for a while. Uh, and whenever they've tried it, the uh, Gorsha feel, you can see this look on their face when they're having it, that it's like very nostalgic, mm -hmm. very fond memories. And often they have this story of like, when we used to love on, uh, it when it was Eid or when we had guests over, because that was like the elite, um, the elite is that, that they would donate for their guests and so they would love it when guests would come over so that they can try the gorgeous meal but usually their parents would be like no you can't have it until the guests have it and then you can't have it until the guests leave so then they would just be waiting as children waiting for the guests to leave so they can try some of the gorgeous meal and it's it's quite interesting because it's from an array of different people and uh, different generations they have the same very similar stories about the teas and desserts even our kind of choy, which is the Afghan fruit tea, um, all very natural flavors. Again, um, as I was saying, like these, these herbs and these spices, they have such great um, uses for our body and such great benefits for our body. Like, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's also something that was used on special occasions. So it was brought out, it was made in special occasions. Everyone would get together, have a cup of tea, share stories and stuff. So, um, yeah, and the, um, from the flavouring side of it, uh, it's natural green tea. There's no flavour. Um, people always ask me, do you add colouring to it? And I I, think that I never do. It's, I don't need to because it, there's a technique. It's actually made from green tea. So the natural green
green tea leaf. Um, mm-hmm. it, there's a, you boil it for a really long time. There's a specific pulling technique that oxidizes the green tea and that becomes red. And then when you add milk to it, it becomes pink. So, um, so it's all like natural. There's a hit of cardamom in it. Cardamom's got such great antioxidant benefits. Green tea itself is really, really good. Um, for, it has quite a cancer fighting properties, antioxidants. And now, nowadays we see rose water. Rose water is also a very key flavor in it. Um, mm-hmm. Nowadays we see rose water as being marketed in mainstream as like all the benefits it has for your skin. It's been um, shown, it's been proven and researched to have uh, benefit for conditions like eczema or other skin conditions. So it has such, and in Afghanistan back then, it was like in the pure, pure and raw form. It, there was no like, genetically modified anything then so it was just it's just really really um wholesome and healthy to have if you don't add the double cream mind you so it's really a testament to how we we um were using really wholesome resources to uh to the best of its ability like we were making the most of the resources that we had at the time and it didn't matter it wasn't about for example if you're rich or you're poor if you've got more or if you've got less everyone was was would be um uh hospitable everyone wanted guests you know a lot of the time you think oh if you don't if you're um an afghan and you're living in poverty like why would you want guests like why would you want to put yourself out and make these kind of desserts or why would you want to put yourself out to um create these these things which actually are very time consuming but again it's part and parcel of the, the culture the tradition and it's so important that's how important it is to serve guests yeah of course yeah, that's... Sorry? carry on <laughs> sorry yeah so that's part and parcel of it and it does create a very nostalgic thing because obviously those are all good memories that are it, it these foods are made on special events and special occasions and so yeah. when people are tasting it, there's such this, a very strong connection between taste and memory. And so when we remember something, we can almost remember the taste of the thing that we're having. So as I was saying at the beginning, is like when I would see people, I could see from the look on their face what it was, and they, everyone had the same sort of nostalgic um, expression of like, wow, this reminds me of, you know, my youth or my childhood or whatever event it was that they had at. Like yeah. On, on Eid or yeah yeah you touch on special occasions here obviously with the, the celebrations going on this weekend it's always uh, fantastic to hear about you know the kind of special recipes that are, are could particularly kind of reveled in on these kind of events um, so Dakani, it would be really great obviously you've got this upcoming recipe book um, it would be fantastic with so many families celebrating Eid this weekend to hear about you know, some recommendations uh, for, for recipes that are just fantastic for celebrations that we, you would usually find at an Afghan celebration, whether it be Nowruz or, or Eid, uh, something else. But, you know, the mm. idea that it's such an intrinsic part of the celebration. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, Cobra's already mentioned uh, one of the favourites for Eid, which is the Goshefil, which is a thin, crumbly pastry with icing sugar and pistachios and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, that's um, a favorite as well as um, a shupera, which is like an Afghan milk fudge with lots of nuts through it. Um, and we do things like we have like a milk custard called Vidni, which you can layer with all sorts of different kind of thinner jellies called mahout, um, and kind of create this really beautiful spread of different colors. Uh, and in the book, what I've done is I've tried to put all those um, recipes really in one chapter and that's the chapter that's attached to the part of my parents story when you know things in Afghanistan are really starting to um, become quite uh, dangerous and there's like these kind of clouds hanging overhead at the time of the um, Soviet occupation of the country because during that time you know my parents during the turmoil um, that was the same time that my parents were married um, they had their children you know they celebrated Eid and birthdays and noodles and everything and I think really what I'm trying to say there by putting these celebratory recipes in that chapter is 
even in turmoil and in times of hardship and change, as I think, you know, a lot of people in Afghanistan are still experiencing this kind of will to life and this desire to hold on to normality and to honour occasions through food. People still hold on to that, you know, and um, I think that Eid for many people, especially now, like in a COVID-riddled world, is going to be really you know, tinged with a lot of sadness and loss. But still, you know, we have these rituals that are marked through food um, and, and it's a really important healing process and an expression of um, of what it is to, to kind of own your identity. So, um, yeah, I and I think my favourite would be um, something like the Fidney just because it's so delicious. <laughs> yeah. And Marcel, what about you? Do you have a particular favorite dish that's been, you know, also included in all your deliveries and hard work that you've <laughs> let some eat dishes to people? Um, kind of what's your what's your favorite dish? See, my favorite dish is something that I've brought to my family and Josh now being part of our family and then being like, what is this? They call him Josh. You know, Josh is the boil guys, right? His name is Joshua. They call him Josh. So every time I'm just like, oh my God. Um, and he loves a roast. And on Eid, so we've we've integrated a roast and uh, it's Afghan lamb, it's leg of lamb, you know, the classic, the usual. My mum doesn't like, she's like, it's too smoky. I don't like, I don't like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, but then um, we bought the crispy triple cooked potatoes and a gravy from the beef fat and like you know caramelized and then a sweet potato mash and we kind of mix that now with the rice. So my dad will take his rice, you know, the kofli palau. He will take his lamb. Then we have the sweet potato. Then we have the gravy on the rice. This is the new thing. This is the new favorite thing. Um, and yeah, like it's actually, it's an, we call it the Afghan roast. We're like, okay, that's our version on Sundays. <laughs> like, that's what we want to do. Um, and mantu is always something that's been amazing. And what Josh and I have done is we've changed the minced meat to smoked brisket. And we're hoping to send them out frozen to our customers to steam at home <laughs> and just try this little new version. So yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And Cobra, what about you? Obviously, you touched on Gretchen Feel, but what's your other kind of favorite go to on a celebration? Oh, Cobra, you're muted. You might just need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Take some. That was helpful, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was just saying that I, I really like the. Um, I came off tried the Afghan pink tea because I think it's quite filling in itself and I think it's just like warm and homey and I feel like it's very comforting when I have it. Um, so I really do like the Afghan pink tea. Um, and but meal wise, I'm just a very traditional girl. I just love my cobbly like the, <laughs> it's the rice with the chopped um, uh, raisins and, and carrots and and I would just really love having that. Um, but sweet spice, I just like my tea. Yeah. Oh, again, so, so many hunger, <laughs> hunger pines. <laughs> now. Um, I think what we'll do now is we'll open up to the floor for questions. We have a couple in um, from Instagram a couple of days ago. Um, so I'll kick off to begin with. Um, Dakani, someone asked, uh, when can we buy your recipe book? When, when's it out? Where can we, where can we get it from? Um, Sure. So it's out in Australia, New Zealand on the 29th of September this year. Um, In the US and the UK, it's out on the 1st of October. Um, And it'll be out in um, the Netherlands next year in March, translated, if anyone wants a copy, translated. (laughs) But you can also pre-order already online. Um, So Amazon or Booktopia, that's like an Australian website where you can pre-order. So it's open for pre-orders already if um, anyone wants a copy. Amazing. So exciting. Um, Okay, we've got also another one from Masal. Um, Someone asked, what dish from your your current menu would you most recommend? What's your your favourite dish? Mm, That's hard. I say the narco kit because it's got like eight different condiments that there's bound to be like (laughs) I like the chutney and I like the red onion pickles and the crispy onions and I prefer the smoked lamb 
but a lot of people prefer the smoked brisket but I've had smoked brisket for about 10 years of my life and I'm good for a little bit <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah I would definitely recommend um, the narco kits for sure and the mac and cheese as a side uh, yeah it's just beautiful <laughs> yeah uh, someone else also asked for you um, how kind of easy it is for you to then with with sort of your halal um, cooking and, and kind of the inclusive nature of cue point how easy is it for you to kind of cater for lots of different different diets how do you you know factor in like vegan diets and and gluten-free as well as, as as other stuff oh josh hates me i wish he was here for this question because <laughs> when you speak like uh, it's it's actually quite difficult but it's not anymore because it's five years now and now it's become it's by being the ethos of your company it's something you just question when we say we need a labna you just know that means it's a vegan labna when you say this you just know the chef to save himself time and ag and fights will make vegan not vegetarian and then we say to vegetarian clients oh if you want cheese or full fat please rather than say to vegan you know it's the opposite with us because yeah. if you think that way from the kitchen standpoint they're already making sure that they're good with that. Like, you know, um, the narcos are, the nuns are dairy free. So it's having to constantly think backwards from what the actual current environment tells you, like cater to the meat, cater to the this. No, 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 cater to the vegans. Is that dairy free or no, it's not dairy free. So we mean to make sure we have a supplier that will always provide us with vegan and dairy free buns. And it had it was complicated starting up and constantly changing suppliers, making mistakes, learning. Uh -huh. And now the chef, um, head chef and his team very much think when I say something or I say we're going to do this, they're like, okay, so that's going to be vegan. That's going to be pectin. We're going to use this. There's no jet lag. Like, it's just yeah. how they think. And I, I think that's what, if we included that into the hospitality industry a bit more, it takes a bit more effort, but it's what Cobra and Dukani was saying as well. Like the ancestry has been there for so long. Like people talk about vegan, but it's been in Hinduism for thousands of years. Uh -huh. And they actually let the vegetables and the spices do the work rather than Satan and this. And I think it's going back to go forwards and to say that this isn't a new thing, guys. This is just how some people eat in certain parts of Asia or the Middle East. And if we were to recognize that, you know, it'd be really interesting to bring that out a little bit more and show that we could change things just slowly. <laughs> <laughs> um great i mean it sounds like it's always a good opportunity you know to start as a baseline of something and then build from it it just seems like a easier way than i can imagine when you get lots of requests and you've got to that's kind how of it was in the beginning we want this for i was like uh okay yeah we can do that I'm like yeah 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 and then it's like okay scratch understand learning lots of training courses lots of recipe development yeah. to get to the stage where we can explain what inclusivity means and that if you contact us we will create a custom thing for your cultural religious or personal belief and you know that's fine and it's encouraged and people are like what do you mean it's encouraged inclusivity <laughs> tell us what you want it's fine. yeah exactly fantastic um We've also got a question here from the live comments. Someone's asked, um, I'll flash it up on the screen. Are you able to buy or import any ingredients from Afghanistan? If so, um, if not, um, what would you love to import to add extra character and flavor? Uh, do we have any volunteers to answer that one? Well, I guess um, I'll quickly say, oh, sorry, that um, these days, we're so lucky um, in like living in different countries around the world because there are so many like little Afghan stores that will do the hard work of importing traditional beautiful ingredients. So just as an example, um, we have the raisins that are from Afghanistan and rice, you know, and those are things that are still exported from Afghanistan that we have the benefit of being able to use um, in our recipes and ingredients um, all over the world. Mm. And is there something in particular you'd say then recommend this person um, obviously seems to want a kind of tip for what is the uh, best flavor to add character? Is there any recommendations from you guys? If you only had to, you know, sell one thing, <laughs> what would it be? 
Not so much one thing. I'd love to, I would love to directly one so that the diaspora increases import and export to Afghanistan. So we become more companies to go, actually, I want to go direct to you. I'm going to create a relationship with this guy. Being in Afghanistan, like we go so often um, to see family because we have quite a lot of family still there. And when we go, the difference between what you eat, I put on five pounds in a week for my brother's wedding because we decided to get married back home uh-huh. and I couldn't fit into my dress. And I was like, how? Uh-huh. Because you have the cream, you have breakfast one, just like in The Hobbit and breakfast two. Uh-huh. Breakfast one is for you. Breakfast two is when the guests wake up and it's fancy. And then you have lunch, then lunch two. And then you start preparing dinner. And I was like, this is why. But just the spices, the flavors, the produce is something I've never, ever tasted again in my life. I'm not that well traveled, but I do know that that's just, it's something else, even the green tea. So I think maybe just getting certain elements and then integrating them and creating different relationships. But I know I would definitely want spices from the kebab shops, the kebab houses. I want that. I want it here. I want to push on. (laughs) Completely. Um, We've got one other question. Uh, which uh, is in the comments as well. Is eating fish on Nauru is also a tradition in Afghanistan? Do you have any volunteers to take on that question? Um, I can quickly comment um, before the other, if any of the ladies don't want to, but um, yes, it is. Um, Traditionally in Afghanistan, it would be these small um, crispy fish that are battered and deep fried and they would be piled high on these giant trays um, from the vendors that would sell the mai, which is the fish. And then alongside it would be huge platters of jalebi, which is like a sticky, sweet a dessert. So it's like a sweet and sour eaten together. And I think like in many cultures, the fish symbolizes new life, um, which is what Naurus is all about as well, because it's um, celebrated on the spring equinox in Afghanistan. Fantastic. Again, so hungry. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much, guys, uh, for all answering all those questions. I think that's it on the questions front. Um, But just before we wrap up, um, obviously, just to say that we are uh, actively running our um, COVID appeal at the moment. Um, Our staff are working on the front lines to help people uh, by installing hand washing facilities and providing protective equipment, emergency food packages, and um, also safe work opportunities for people who otherwise are, are finding themselves out of work. Um, You can donate uh, via our website or alternatively, um, if you'd like to make a voluntary donation, you can also uh, text Arezu to uh, 70085 to donate five pounds. Um, text costs five pounds was on standard rate message. Um, but thank you so much to everyone for tuning in today and for our fantastic speakers. It's been such a lovely conversation. Um, again, happy Eid to everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, see you all next time. Thank you. See you next time. Bye. Thank you Bye. so much.